This is Michael Mullang. Today is August 27, 2014. Just finished giving a uh, presentation for the Denver Data Science and Business Analytics Meetup. Uh, it was regarding a debate about AI, whether it's going to destroy or help humanity. I took the position that AI will at some point become uncontrollable and will be a grave threat to humanity. The audio and video uh, recorded at the event was poor, so I'm re-recording it here as a screen capture. So first to define some terms, weak versus strong AI. What we have today, machine learning and so forth, is weak AI. Uh, this distinction was actually first noticed 50 years ago. Uh, and the characteristics of strong AI would include fringe consciousness, essence essence accident discrimination and ambiguity tolerance. We don't have those yet. To define another term, the singularity, I'm surprised at how many people have not heard this term before. I first learned of it in 1993 from text files uh, from Werner Vinge. Uh, this was posted to Usenet and various bulletin board systems, but actually uh, I found out that later that the term was invented by von Neumann in 1958. And of course, of course Kurzweil has been uh, bandying it about for the past uh, decade. So what does the singularity mean? It means that it's referring to uh, when computers start learning exponentially. Um, and if we call that point B, and if we're at point A, if we want to predict what happens at a point C in the future beyond the singularity, uh, it's not really possible because we don't know what's going to happen once computers start learning exponentially. And so we can sort of predict what happens before the singularity. You know, we can project stock prices, we can project weather and so forth, um, but we, we don't know what's going to happen after uh, the singularity occurs. And so it's, there's, there's, there's this analogy drawn to a black hole. There's this event time horizon. We can't see beyond uh, the singularity. And so that's why um, this event of computer self-learning is given this name like as if it were a black hole, because we can't see beyond its time horizon. So what happens at the singularity? Well, it depends on whether you grew up in the 80s or the 90s, what you think will happen. <clears throat> now, what do we mean by um, learning and growing exponentially? Now, Arnold used the term geometric, but that's really just the discrete version of uh, exponentially. Uh, if you remember from uh, cal calculus, an exponential curve uh, looks like a bowl. It just uh, grows faster and faster because uh, every time step you're multiplying by constant alpha. And so it just goes up faster and faster, infinitely faster for an infinite time. Well, that's not the real world. <coughs> it's not the real world because the real world is constrained by resources. So, for example, uh, a nuclear bomb, you have one neutron that splits one atom and that generates two neutrons and to four and to eight and 16 and so forth. But that progression does not proceed to infinity because there is a finite amount of fissile material and so it eventually levels off. So this is what is known as a, a positive feedback loop. That's the beginning of the process, the exponential growth part and then uh, you eventually run into resource exhaustion, and that's the, the negative feedback uh, portion. And, this, and, and when you combine those two uh, feedback processes together, you end up with these S-curves. So what kind of resources uh, do we need to, uh, to emulate a human brain? Well, there are a couple of numbers that have been bandied about. Uh, there's one exaflop, which is one billion teraflops, a teraflop being a trillion floating point operations per second, or 80 billion neurons. So what does it mean for an exaflop? Well, you could string together 200,000 GPU cards, or it's all of Amazon, or all of Microsoft, or all of Facebook, or all of the NSA Utah data center. Now, don't quote me on these. I mean, these are accurate within an order of magnitude or two, so don't go making stock uh, picks based on this slide, or it's about 10% of Google. 
Now, how about the 80 billion neurons? <coughs> well, it's interesting because there's a recent Stanford webinar on how to build 10 billion parameter neural network in your basement. They just used 12 GPU cards and it consumed 12U out of a 48U rack. Uh, now, if you just arbitrarily assume five connections per neuron, this is 2 billion neurons. And so, multiplying it out, if you wanted to do the 80 billion neurons for a human brain, you would need 480 GPU cards. Now, who has 480 GPU cards? Uh, this guy, he got a new gig, and uh, his first day in his cubicle, he said, oh, uh, let me, I need some office supplies. I need 1,000 GPU cards. Uh, so this stuff exists out there, but when, do, when is this really going to happen that we'll have a computer as p capable as a human brain? Now, Kurzweil, of course, famously bandies about the year and number 2029. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, the same sort of number was predicted way back in 1988 by Hans Moravec. Um, and uh, th this is more interesting because he makes a distinction between supercomputers and personal computers. So uh, in this chart, supercomputer is about 2009. Uh, it's probably about nine years off of that. Uh, and uh, personal computer uh, about uh, <clears throat> 20 years after that. And that's kind of what we see uh, you know, with old supercomputers. If you look at the top 500 and their processing power, uh, supercomputers from 13, 14 years ago are about as powerful as a desktop computer today. So that, that's about the usual uh, lag. And, um, and so these are ver various predictions <coughs> on when we'll get an exaflop an exaflop also happening to be about uh, the supposed power of a human brain. And these are optimistic and pessimistic projections. Optimistically, uh, it would, would be about 2020. Op and the optimistic assumptions are that electricity is free and bountiful and that we'll have uh, new chips available to us besides just Intel Xeons. And the most pessimistic is that we're stuck with Intel Xeons and uh, you have to pay for electricity. But remember, that was a supercomputer. Personal computers of that power come 10 to 13 years later, and they will be available in every corner drugstore. Uh, there would be complete pro proliferation, unlike plutonium. Any kid in his ba mom's basement can go to the corner drugstore and get computing power. They're talking about the year 2030, 2035 here, can get the computing power of a human brain and you know wait five ten years beyond that and it would be more powerful than a human brain superhuman intelligence available at your corner drugstore complete proliferation so what are the elements needed for this malicious AI that I uh, am talking about here well the first one is you need to have this computational substrate in existence that's what I've been talking about so far uh, I'm going to talk about extremely briefly the next two things, a self-learning algorithm, by which I mean I define self-learning to be uh, a computer that can program itself. And we also need someone reckless. Now, a self-learning algorithm need not have all the characteristics of a human. It need not have human intelligence, it need not have human consciousness, it need not have a human soul. It just needs to be able to program itself and to evolve itself. And the human stuff isn't necessary for all of that. And a frequent analogy made in the AI world is between birds and airplanes. Uh, an airplane has the essential quality of having flight, but it is nothing like a bird. It goes about flight by a completely artificial means. It does not mimic nature. We don't need to mimic nature to have intelligence. And this, this analogy goes all the way back uh, to 1963, at least, if not sooner. Uh, recklessness. So this is an open-air nuclear test conducted by the U.S. government. Uh, one such open-air test uh, was done upwind of a, a John Wayne movie being filmed. Uh, of the 200 or so cast and crew, half of those came down with cancer, and half of those died, including John Wayne himself. Now, this is just the recklessness of the U.S. government. Imagine the recklessness of a virus writer 
in his mom's basement. Or imagine a government, perhaps a third world government, eager to see what their AI can do. And so they pull out all the stops, they disable the Asimov three rules of robotics that maybe they originally put in. And uh, so if you combine this recklessness uh, with uh, the magic formula of self-learning, my personal hunch is that there is some E equals MC squared magic formula for learning that has yet to be discovered, and the uh, existence of sufficient computer hardware uh, such that the hardware is ubiquitous and available on the corner store. Now, if I've scared you, I'm going to just end with this one more still frame from an 80s movie. On no November 20, 1983, the Sunday before Thanksgiving, uh, there aired on uh, a U.S. public network a film so frightening that the network felt it necessary at the conclusion of the film to have uh, a discussion period. And one of the first things the commentator said after the film was over was, go open a window, look outside, it's all still there. So, it's all still there for now. <laughs>